Hello, everyone. Good evening. Let's start the session. Okay, so uh, my name is Mihira Mehrotra, and I'm the president for the Virtual Med Society for the year 2022-2023. Uh, VMS is a student-led society that was started in 2020 during the COVID era. It's basically a community for aspiring medical students to come together and create content for other aspiring medical students so that they can get into their dream university. Um, for the last two years, we've created a lot of content, like we've had mock MMI sessions, newsletters, and virtual doctor shadowing sessions. And today, I present to you our first webinar of the year, which is Pathway to Medicine in the US, which has been done in collaboration with Goethe University. And our speaker today is Mukara Murtaza, which is a second year BSMD student from Baylor University, Texas. His current specialization is in neurology. And over to you, Mukaram. Hope you guys enjoyed the session. Uh, thank you so much, Mihira. Uh, okay. So, firstly, thank you all for joining. And I know it's midday. And uh, I appreciate everyone coming here for this session. Now, what I will cover over this session or over this hour of our session is basically the idea of how we get from high school to a medical school and a little bit about what life entails after medical school, right? Because that is an important prospect to cover. So firstly, my background, I did A-levels in Dubai and then applied to US after a gap year and got into a BSMD program. Now I'll get into BSMD and what is BSMD in just a bit, but yeah, I will discuss the typical and atypical pathways to medicine in the US and why, why should you why should you at all choose US as a you know your location for doing medicine? So let's get into it. So over this one hour or so, I'll go over the application process in the US the typical and atypical routes for getting into med school, the fee structure, also including sponsor, uh, sponsorship and scholarships, we have both. Um, then the major distinction between USMT and other medicine programs all across the globe and uh, opportunities and exposure in the US specifically. And of course, a little bit about life after medical school. So firstly, the application process in the US is quite straightforward that you need 12 to 13 years of high school, as in Dubai, we would consider year 12 and year 13 uh, as part of your school that you should be done with. And over the last two years in our pandemic time, SAT and ACT, two standardized testings that are that were compulsory for United States admissions were put to optional. Okay, so most of the um, testing curriculums and standardized testings were put to optional solely because the registration and the testing centers both were functioning, but they were functioning under capacity. Okay, now what you see in front of you is just an overview of what the US process is because it is not a very straightforward process. I cannot uh, assure you, or I don't think anyone in the world can assure you that with this stats or with these grades, you are assured an admission at XYZ University in the US, right? So it's a it's a compilation of many different things. Uh, mainly, as you can see in the pie chart, the GPA component, which is basically, basically your grades, your scores, all that comprises of 30%. I know it comes as a shock, especially to me when I was applying, 30% is quite a small figure right if you think about it so where does the rest 70 percent go so if you if you see the 40 percent goes into extracurriculars which is very 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 important in the us probably the most important uh, or probably the only country that really weighs extracurriculars that much right and then we have around 20% or so that is weighted by your SAT or ACT because of the standardized testings. And 10% could be miscellaneous 
It could be whether many different things from what background you come, what's your ethnicity, X, Y, Z. It could be anything. Miscellaneous is uh, that 10% is you something that you cannot account for. That 10% is probably beyond your control, right? So that's why I'm just going to focus on the other three components, more or less. Firstly, your GPA for getting into a US school or your scores should be above average, right? So there is no uh, requirements that you should have biology, chemistry, physics at A stars or A and maths at X, Y, Z or anything, right? So you don't have a standard that you would have in UK or you would have um, in Australia or you would have in other European countries. So even if you go visit the websites for admissions, you won't see at all their preferred subjects or the preferred scores or the preferred grades, okay? So GPA is more or less of your um, academia. So how do you perform in your class? How do you show your progress? If you're a straight A student or if you are a progressively A student or if you are somewhere above the average student, right? So all that comes under your GPA. With your extracurriculars, what US wants to see, because they say that they have a holistic approach to application, they want to see what are you as a person? Are you just someone who is always into books or are you more than that? Are you someone who loves sports? Are you, are you someone who has an entrepreneur mindset? Are you someone who you know, has started something from nothing? So they want to see that in your extracurriculars. Now, it does not have to be anything extra again, like you opening up, you know, multi-million dollar company or anything. It could be something really small, but something really meaningful. Okay, something super small, but something really meaningful and how it affects or how it changes your life personally. Then comes your ACT or uh, SATs, which are basically standardized testings mostly MCQs. Um, it goes over the topics of English, maths, and a bit of reading comprehension as well. Okay. Uh, ACT has an additional component for science, but SAT does not. So with these scores, because you need to understand that standardized testing is a way to break even, right? Now let's say a student with a perfect GPA with all A stars or a 4.0 GPA has amazing extracurriculars. How do I choose one over the other? How do I choose one over the rest? That is done by the SAT or ACT. So because standardized testing is a good way to break that even or break that tie, because I know that the questions are said exactly the same for all. I know the questions are going to be the same difficulty for all. I'm not going to make one paper harder for another, or I'm not going to make one paper easier for, for another. So that is a good way to break even. But during the pandemic time, or at least when I applied, and even this year, many universities have gone test optional. So that means you're not required to submit these scores. But that does not mean you should not, because at the end, some factor from it might be taken into consideration. Okay. And once you are done, once you have all of this ready with you, you will proceed to going to either of the two platforms called as Common App or Coalition App. These are basically your portals through which you will apply to different universities. Now in the US, this is one tedious part that I personally faced and I was at the end quite overwhelmed by it is every university is going to ask you a different question, all right? I repeat, every university is going to ask you a different question because they want to know how invested are you actually into that university, okay? So one university could ask you, why are you applying to New York University? The other one could ask you, tell us something throughout your high school that you faced and you probably thought you could not overcome, but you eventually did. So they want to know you as a person and that is done through these essays and through these questions. Now, I think over the last year, US universities have started getting into uh, interviews as well. So they do conduct interviews, but uh, a very small proportion out of the many, okay? 
So that is a basic overview of application process. If you guys have any questions, any doubts, uh, we'll keep that towards the end of the session. And uh, But this is how the application works in the US. It's not a straightforward uh, answer. It's not a straightforward, straightforward path, but what it is, it's a holistic process. So if you think it could be a good thing for you, because if, if your GPA is a bit lower, you can uh, compensate for that with your extracurriculars or with your SAT scores and other way around as well, right? So it's, it's a good thing, but if you see in different countries like UK and Europe, Germany, Netherlands, wherever it may be, you will see that they have a standard or a minimum entry requirement. And if you do not, if you fail to meet that, the rest of the application is just discarded right away, right? So you do not have that buffer zone or you do not have that benefit of doubt given to you. But the US does because it has an, it has a holistic process or an approach to application. Now let's talk more specifically about the application process from high school to med school. What, what, what comes under those or what comes with that? So once you finish your high school, a typical high school uh, student will apply to a bachelor's program in the US. This bachelor's program could be related to science or it could be completely on another spectrum. It could be arts, it could be liberal arts, it could be business, it could be theater arts, music, anything, okay, anything. You will apply for your undergrad's degree first. Then once you get into school or once you get into university, there is an advisory committee. There is a committee set for people who want to eventually apply to med school, okay? Because in the US, you do not have a straightforward medical route. You have to get through with four years of bachelor's, then apply to four years of an MD program, and then you become a doctor. Meanwhile, in the UK or other European countries, even Dubai, or even Asian countries, you have a straight five-year program, five to six-year program, where you, after six years, you are called a doctor, okay? I'll get into the distinguish, uh, distinguishing factors a bit later on, but I'm just giving you an overview of how you get into from high school to med school, essentially. So now you are in university, you're doing your courses and stuff. Now, AAMC, which is the American Association of Medical Schools, will or has a pre-med planner. So that means it will say one year of biology needed with lab, one year of chemistry needed with lab, one year of physics needed with lab. Now, what that means is that you should have, in, in your university, you should have done one year of biology. That means two semesters. Remember, US has mostly semesters, not trimesters. So you will have four, four months semesters. So there will be two semesters, okay? Four, four months. And in between that, you will have a winter break. So these four, this one semester will be called half a year. So if something is given as one year of biology, that means you will have to take it for two semesters. Okay, same thing for chemistry, same thing for physics and so on. So the best thing about looking for a university that has an advisory committee is that you don't have to worry about anything. Your pre-med advisor is going to choose the courses for you. All you have to do is register for them, okay? They will choose in a way that by the end of your third year, you will be done with all your prerequisites for medical school. Okay, you will be done with all your prerequisites and you will be preparing for something called as the MCAT, which is the medical college admission test. Okay, MCAT is basically accumulation of everything you have studied in science related to your pre-med in the past three years. Sounds intimidating, I know, it's an eight hour exam and uh, you need to score above par if you want to get into med school, okay? It's not impossible, but it is a bit, of course, at this stage you will feel, okay, this, th this is a lot, might as well, you know? 
straight up get into med school somewhere else, do five years, do six years, and then get into that. I'll get into the perks of doing this way, and I'll also compare the cons, okay? Then after giving your MCAT, you will get your results. With your results, you will apply to your med school, okay? You will apply to your preferred med school. You can apply to over 100, 200, does not matter, okay? There's no, there's no ban or there is no restriction on how many you apply to. But remember, you will have to go through the application process of applying to med school. Now, let's say your MCAT score is good, your GPA is good, uh, everything's good, and you get an interview call from med school, right? Med school will give you a give you a call and be like, "Hey, you have, uh, you know, successfully finished the first round of screening, and we would like to have you over for an interview." In these interviews. It is going to be all about you. No one's going to ask you about anything related to your sciences, nothing. They want to see if you are a good fit for the mission given to them, medical school, right? Every, every school is going to have a mission. Every school is going to have a statement. Every school will have a vision. So they want to see if you are a good fit for them. That's why you have interviews. Now, everything goes well, your interview is successful. Then you get an admission into med school, okay? then you will accept the admission offer and that's when you begin the next four years of your medical school journey so first four years are done with your pre-med okay the first four years are done with the pre-med by the end of the three years in the first four you will be applying for uh, med schools with your mcat score meanwhile you will also finish your fourth year of pre-med so you will graduate with any degree, bachelor's of science in neuroscience, bachelor's of science in biology, anything it will be. Then after the first four years, you will start the next four years, which is the MD route, okay, doctor of medicine. After you finish these four years, you are called an MD doctor, okay? So you might have seen in many TV shows, or you might have seen in actuality that there will be doctor so-and-so, and there'll be a comma, and then you will have MD written to that. Okay, so it emphasizes that this doctor has done MD. Okay, sounds a bit convoluted. I'll summarize it in two sentences. You will have four plus four years. First four years are your pre-med, where you are getting ready for your med school. The next four years are for your medical school itself. Total eight years in uh, total, okay? Okay. Now, there are two routes, typical routes that I just explained, four years of pre-med, four years of medical school, okay? Yes, I have mentioned something as MD and DO. MD is your doctor of medicine, and DO is your doctor of osteopathic medicine, okay? MD is mostly allopathic, DO is mostly osteopathic. If you guys want to know the, distinguish, uh, the distinguishing you know, component of that, you guys can just put in the question box and I'll try to answer towards the end of this session. After finishing these eight years in total, you will apply for residency, which is your specialization. You complete your residency. Residency can range all the way up to from three years, anywhere up to seven to eight years, okay, depending on how specialized your fields are. If you're doing something like family, family medicine, or if you're doing something like GP, it's only two to three years. But if you're doing something like neurosurgery or if you're doing something like cardiovascular surgery, it can go up to seven to eight years, okay? You complete your residency and then you apply for fellowship. Fellowship is optional because fellowship is someone who wants to really, really, really become specialized in one thing. Yes, a fellowship is optional, usually ranges from one to three years at most. Now comes the atypical route where I am doing, which is a combined seven years program for BSMD. BS stands for Bachelor's of Science, MD stands for Doctor of Medicine. Now in these seven years, you can get two kinds of admissions. You can get conditional and you can get assured, okay? I am given an assured admission, but there is also a conditional. In conditional, what happens is you are, you can, you can think of yourself as being part of the medical school but all you have to do is, as I told you, after the first four years or first three years for, for this seven-year program, because your BS is going to be three years, they just want to finish your 
prerequisites and they will start your medical school, okay? So the first three years, after the three years, you will be given the MCAT, where you will have to score an average score, around 500, okay? Which is, which is very achievable, which is very doable. It's an average score. And you will have to have somewhere around 3.5 above GPA, okay? And if you do meet these two conditions, and if you do meet the number of hours needed for volunteering and doctor shadowing, you are automatically into a med school. No need for reapplication, no need to go through the interview process, no need to apply to 100 plus medical schools, nothing like that. And with Assured, which happens to a very less amount of students, okay, Assured is for a very less amount of students, where based on your high school's performance and based on your first year of university's performance, one and a half, not first year, one and a half, uh, you are assured the admission in MD, okay? You will still have to appear for the MCAT and stuff, but let's say you don't get a 500. It's fine. You, you are still, you will still be in medical school, okay? There are these two kinds. And then you have a pre-professional program, which is similar to BSMD, which basically trains you in such a way that you almost are guaranteed a certain MCAT score which is like a 518, which is like 98th percentile or something. And if you get a score like that, the most going to be in a medical school. Okay. Now, atypical routes are not offered by every university. So you have to filter them out. Typical routes are open to each and every university in the US. Let's talk fees because financial feasibility is a very, very, very big prospect. On average, US medical schools cost around 54,000 USD, okay? Which if you convert it, should be somewhere near, I would say 180 to 190,000 dirhams per year, okay? But this is tuition fee without any scholarship or financial aid. Now, this fees also does not include the application, the MCAT, and the interview cost. Okay, the application fees, that means each school is going to charge you around $40 to $45 for application. MCAT fees is around $230 to $250. And interview cost could vary because if you have to go to, let's say, Massachusetts, which is on the East Coast, or if you have to travel to California and you're living in Texas, you, you will have to catch a flight or you will have to drive yourself there. So interview costs usually entails just your travel and those kind of expenditures. Okay. Now this 54,000 has, or is mostly not the case because people do receive scholarship and financial aid, okay? Based on your financial situation. If, if you come from a lower uh, socioeconomic background, you are mostly given a financial aid. And if you have good merits, if you have a good, uh, GPA, good uh, academic standing, you are for sure given a scholarship. So this prize you could see around 30, could be as less as, less as 25,000 USDs to around 35 USD, okay? Uh, for comparison, my university is uh, on the higher end. It's a private university. So without help, the tuition of my university is 65,000 USD. But because of scholarship, I pay annually 20,000 USD. Okay, more or less. Uh, just I'm just talking about uh, tuition. Okay, 20,000 is my tuition. Uh, yeah, US medical schools offer several universities. Some are need-based and some could be on academic merit. There are full ride and third-party scholarships available. What that means is there are businesses wanting to sponsor students from different backgrounds. So let's say if there is a person who has an Asian business, he will sponsor Asian students, maybe one or two, but he will give them like 5,000 to 10,000 USD, USD as the uh, scholarship. And full ride, of course, from its name, you know that many universities based on your merits, based on your extracurriculars, will let you study for free for the four years. Again, Full ride scholarships are very, very difficult to get. You have to show determination. You have to show complete, complete, you know, like, yes, I'm going to be the best and give this university in return. 
so what, what will you give them in return? Probably do research over there, work in their fellow hospital and all that, okay? So it's not, it's not, I mean, I would love a full ride, but yeah, you usually, us being international students, we are probably considered last for full ride scholarships, but there are students that I know personally who have come in from uh, Egypt uh, who are on full ride scholarship. Okay. Okay. Why US at all? Why why go through this gruesome process? Why go through this tedious process of doing so much of studying when I can go to UK or any other European countries or any country for that matter? I don't think anywhere in the world you have the US system. That's why I've kept USMD versus literally the world. Okay. So Typically, USMD is eight years of core education before residency. Eight years of core education means eight years of books in front of you, okay? It, to some, it might sound amazing because being a doctor is all they want. And to some, it might sound like, okay, eight years of just pure education. I mean, not just pure education. You have clerkships, you have rotations, you'll be working in hospitals, but there's a lot of studying, right? In eight years, you will be studying for the most part. In the UK, that duration is around five to six years, okay? And uh, this eight years is before you can start practicing or become a resident. A resident doctor is someone who works in a hospital, is being paid, and you will be earning. In the UK, you do five to six years, then you get into FGY, which is foundation year program which is two years where you're getting paid a base salary and you're working in a hospital, okay? Now in uh, US, you pay around 53,000 USD per year for four years, while in the UK, you pay around 43,000 USD per year for five to six years. In US or when you're doing USMD, you have a lot of scholarship opportunities available, while in the UK, at least for the most part, or at least when I applied, I got zero scholarship because I was paying full amount. And lastly, but a very, very, very important, uh, this, uh, you know, differentiation is an MD is a doctor of medicine equal well into a master's degree. While in the UK, you are studying for five to six years to gain a bachelor's of medicine and a bachelor's of surgery, which is the MBBS. Most doctors are going to then do MD, which will be three to two years for them. And yeah, but in eight years, you are eventually becoming a doctor of medicine, which is there is, there is no qualification in the field of medicine. I'm not talking about research medicine, which is PhD or anything, but I'm talking about primary care medicine that can top the MD, okay? Uh, this, uh, this is nowhere out of bias, but I'm just, you know, presenting factual information over the year. So there's no uh, certification that is higher than an MD when, when you're comparing doctors, okay? So usually an MBBS doctor won't just suffice with an MBBS degree. He will have to, he or she will have to do an MD degree as well. Okay. And then when it comes to residency, usually what happens is after these, so if you think about it, you haven't started residency until the foundation year two in UK. Okay. You haven't started residency. You're doing clerkships or you're doing rotations basically. You will be working in OBGYN, you will be working with the cardiothoracic, you will be working with the neurosurgeon, you will be working in radiology, interventional radiology, all that. Okay, but you are not specializing yet. You specialize at the same time as you would specialize in the US, which is almost after eight years. Okay, which is almost after eight years. So keep that in mind because many, many students Thing that oh, after five to six years, I'm straight going to go into surgery and start. But no, you do that after a foundation year, two foundation years. Okay. 
uh, opportunities and exposure in the US. As an undergrad, I feel there are way too many opportunities for me to even you know, take because if I do take most of it, I'm just overwhelmed with my workload. So first thing is undergraduate research. Uh, I would just like to pair point one and three with clinical research and undergraduate research. Undergraduate students can work in clinical settings in the US where you can research on actual patients or actual diseases. For instance, I'm working or I'm specializing in neurology and I'm working with patients who have neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's. And unfortunately, they also have uh, cancer, okay, brain cancer, neurological cancer. So we study the parts of the brains that are, how are they affected? Because if you, if you research or if you study Alzheimer's, you will see your uh, cortex basically changing massively. So how does the cancer grow in these areas that are virtually non-existent, right? So we, we study, or I personally study that subject or so those subjects. So I'm doing undergraduate research, but it is a clinical research. Okay. Uh, physician and doctor shadowing is very easily available. We have an affiliated hospital. Every medical university has an affiliated hospital. So we literally walk into the hospital, talk to the receptionist that, uh, hey, I'm a you know, pre-med or I'm a med student. I want to shadow a CT surgeon, a cardiothoracic surgeon. She will give you a list. All you have to do is cold mail them or cold call them. Then, uh, hey, doctor, I want to just shadow with you. And uh, if it's uh, fitting in a schedule, he'll uh, let you in. He, he will even let you stand in his OR as long as you don't do anything. So yeah, it is, it is as easy as that to get doctor shadowing and physicians shadowing in the US. Work experience in different fields and sectors. You don't have to work or you don't have to do anything related to medicine. Uh, for instance, I'm working with my university's admissions department to help uh, other students who are applying to the same program and the same university. I, I, I just help in answering basic questions for them, right? So you can, you can do work like that and you can get a bit of pay also. You get paid usually minimum wage and you can work up to 20 to 40 hours a week, okay? And different clinical and surgical programs offered to undergrads. For instance, Baylor College of Medicine offers surgical programs where around 50 Texas students are chosen to participate in a six to eight week surgical program. So they observe complex surgeries, they observe surgeries that, you know, go on for around six, seven hours. And after the surgery, you will be asked a couple of questions. And uh, when there are no surgeries, you are taught things like suturing, you're th uh, taught things like intubation or, uh, you know, how to literally uh, put an IV lead into someone, right? And you will be, if, if over the six to eight weeks you get proficient, you, you can actually administer it in actual people. So yeah, when it comes to opportunities and exposure, I feel there is no place better than the US. Uh, and uh, I only realized it when I actually went over there and saw these students just like literally making calls and next day going to a hospital and standing in the OR because you cannot do that in Dubai. I have struggled and struggled and struggled to find a decent doctor shadowing or physician program in Dubai. And I guess there are regulations that prevent us from getting it, but yeah. Okay, now let's just talk a bit about what life is after medical school. After all this studying, after, after getting into residency, what does one do, right? Is it worth? Is it worth spending so much? Is it worth taking out loans and getting into student debts and personal debts to put yourself through this residency or put yourself through med school? Because at the end, the question is, what is the return on investment, right? It's a huge investment that your parents will be making. What's the benefit? Is there any benefit? So let's see about that. 
after medical school starts residency, as I told you, where you are working alongside attending physicians who have worked for over 10 to 15 years in that field. So you will be now learning, you will be going to ORs, you will be performing in sessions, you will be doing everything. And you will also be learning different cases. Okay, you will be learning different cases. Now, this is your training part. This is where you are going to a person if you're doing a surgery or if you're a surgeon, if you want to get into general surgery, you'll be getting, you'll be using your hands, you'll be doing everything a normal doctor does. All you might not be given the proper rights to is performing a complex surgery all by yourself. And otherwise, also in, in, in that situation, doctors never perform surgeries individually. You will never see one doctor just performing the entire surgery. You will have group of surgeons, you will have group of doctors in one OR helping you to perform surgery. Okay. Now residency can range from three to seven years, three years being for the basic family medicine, seven years being the most complex, which is neurosurgery. Okay. Now after residency, some may choose to specialize further by doing a fellowship, which is one to three years additional. And on average, a primary care physician makes 260,000 USD a year. On average, a specialist, that means a person who has, who is a specialist, such as a surgeon, makes somewhere base around 370,000 USD. Depending on the years of your residency, depending on the years of your training, a neurosurgeon, uh, we, our professor, one of our professors is a neurosurgeon. And he was making around 98 to 90 or 100,000 USD in his residency training. But once he graduated from residency and he got an attending physician's job, his pay was around 640, he said, or so, somewhere around highest $600,000 range. And we were astounded. We were uh, we, we At that point, we thought, oh, we all want to be neurosurgeons because we can pay off our student debts in literally one check and everything's going to be good. But again, you need to think about how many years you will be spending. You'll probably have gray hair by the end of the residency years. Right? So all that is something all of you will have to consider when you're choosing to do medical. Because a professor once said that if making money is why you want to be a doctor, leave medicine right now and join a tech field or join something that you can do with tech because that is an exponentially growing field. But if you want to do medicine for the essence of it, for, for the nature of it, for the uh, you know nature of helping people, and then go ahead, do medicine. Okay. Um we have time okay I'll, I'll just quickly because uh i think mihira had requested me to get over this usmle again you guys don't have to think about this because it is long eight years nine years ahead you don't have to think about this but what essentially is usmle is it is the licensing exam in the united states okay because after becoming after doing everything now you need to get a license right for example when you get when you do driving you learn with your instructor, you do your test, you do everything, and finally you get your license, right? Similarly, you're working, you're doing, you're studying everything. And once you are done with your residency, you will find, so USMLE has different steps. It has four examinations in total. Uh, step one is usually taken at the second year of medical school. Step two, which is divided into CK and CS, clinical knowledge and clinical skills is taken by the end of your med medical school, which is your fourth year. And after the first year of residency, you take the step three. Okay, so after the first year of residency, you will have a license saying that this individual is a doctor registered in the United States medical licensing and is allowed to practice medicine on his own. Okay, so USMLE is usually the licensing exam. Uh, I won't get into the uh, gist or, you know, I won't get into the details of what a step one, step two, step three exam is, but step two, 
is usually comprised of clinical knowledge because you will be doing your rotations in medical school. So they will give you a, a huge case study about a patient and you will have to diagnose them and provide medication. Okay. Similar with step three, because it is after your residency, first year of residency, you will, given, you will be given a more complex case and you will have to diagnose, provide medication and give remarks. Okay. So it's not as easy as it sounds. It could be a case that could take hours. So you will be just sitting, looking at the case for hours and then decide on what to do. So yeah, ultimately USMLE is the final, the final board examination that you will need. Actually not the final, just before the final, because now if you become a neurosurgeon, you will have to give an examination for the board of neurosurgery. Again, this is not just to US. The UK, I think, has P Lab. Uh, other countries have their own license exams. Dubai has one by DHA. So all this is this is generic throughout every country in the world. Okay. And with that, we come to the end of this small little pathway, just giving you the gist of how universities in the U U US work, your possible routes that you could take, your possible opportunities that you could have. This by no means is for you to be convinced that you should come to US and go through this process, but it is a good way to compare because at the end, you need to really, really think about how much investment you're putting in nowhere in the world medicine is cheap nowhere but you also have to consider how much are you getting back from it right so yeah now um here if you could tell me if there are any questions or uh yeah there are questions so, okay let's let's try to get over those yeah let's do the questions first Okay, so the first question is, what was your spark to have continued your medicine? Uh, a good question, because uh, I was bounded to medicine at a very young age. I was, uh, I did not have, uh, you know, a sudden revelation that you should get into medicine, or I, I did not really think about, because no one in grade eight or grade nine really thinks about, oh, I'll be making million dollars as a doctor, right? No one really thinks about the prospect of money by then. So what sparked my ambition to become a doctor or continue medicine is my general encounters with doctors. I've had uh, several encounters with doctors uh, and each of them uh, much severe and in a very stupid way have gotten hurt. So it, it's just quite amusing how, how the doctor exactly knows which which nerve is exactly at which point or which joint is exactly going to do what. So I think that just, it, it's, it's just quite fascinating because like if, if you think about it, if you just open a human body, you will see just so much happening in it. And a doctor knowing entire information, knowing everything that goes on is, is it's absolutely commendable. Okay. Okay. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, is the USMD program same as MBBS duration? Uh, no, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is not the same duration. So USMD is slightly bit longer. It is around seven to eight years, uh, while the MBBS could be around five to six years. But MBBS and USMD are not the same degrees that you'll be getting. Okay, so USMD is a higher degree than your MBBS. An MD degree is your master's equivalent degree. Okay, a doctor of medicine, while, M while MBBS is just your uh, bachelor's. So you will have to do some extra qualif qualification to become a more credible doctor at the end. Okay, uh, I don't do math. Could I do SAT? Oh yeah, it's basic. As long as you know how to rearrange equations, as long as you know how to draw line graphs and read line graphs, you're good to do SATs. You don't need extra, like you don't need trigonometric functions or I don't know what you guys do in A-levels at this point. So 
yeah you don't need any of those advanced knowledge you can you can do basically sat you in most schools are for 10th graders yeah for 10th graders so yeah you could do sats does not matter if you haven't done math in a while difference between do and md and perks between the two good so do is doctor of osteopathic medicine md is doctor of allopathic medicine do is a more holistic way of approaching medicine okay so it also gives very importance to your mind your brain your emotional state while md is more of a straightforward medicine you if you are coming to an ed or if you're coming to an emergency department room what i will do as an emergency doctor is look for signs look for symptoms straight up okay i'm going to put you in a basic uh what we have a panel of tests i will order maybe an x ray or whatever it may be to get the overall idea and then prescribe medicine according to it but a do on the other end works also assesses your mental state what when you're coming to uh you know an emergency department so do also really works with they, they don't really the, the mission or the vision is not really just taking a scalpel and opening a person up and resolving the issue they take their time do doctors are usually really like if if you have you know uh, anything if you're feeling tense if you're feeling a bit off when you come into ed usually do doctors come into the ed and look at you because they also help you spiritually or holistically heal okay you medicine is not just one case complex you have to uh give regards to many other things you have to think about the emotion state when a patient comes in and all that they are the same you will have to go through the same process of applying to a do or an md school just what i mentioned about usmle right at the very end in in a do do school you don't do a usmle you do a comex c o m e x Okay, which is another licensing exam. Okay, it's the same thing, but it's another licensing exam. So at the end, your doctors, you have the same knowledge, you have the exact same uh, credibility when it comes to that. Just MD school is more straightforward. It's a bit more harder to get into. DO school is a bit easier to get into. Okay, but that does not necessarily necessarily translate to DO schools being. not good schools i had a follow up question to that so is there like do neurology do do yeah like that sure. yeah because okay. do schools at the end will again go through residency right this is all medical schools then you apply for residency now after going through a do school what many people do is they decide to stay in something where they can practice the holistic medicine such as a gp or a family doctor so a very small proportion will get into invasive uh, invasive specialty such as neurosurgery or cardiothoracic cardiothoracic surgery or orth orthopedics right okay so at the end is the same thing okay okay so how do i do doctor shadowing in dubai think, or in the us i think this was when you were talking about the us yeah if if uh someone could just give a follow up because mm -hmm. in dubai it's extremely difficult if you have contacts if you have someone working uh in in a doctor uh in a doctor setting if you have someone working in a hospital probably that's the only way of doing doctor shadowing what i personally suggest that if you are uh from an asian country like india or pakistan go back over there uh for a couple of months because it's way easier to do doctor shadowing over there in dubai i've tried believe me i looked for every single thing and i haven't come across a single thing that gives a proper doctor shadowing experience okay so uh, he got the doctor shadowing session question so it's fine okay does us have the seven year program yeah you I, i'm currently in a seven year program yes us us offers a seven year program they do uh you will have to look for universities that offer bsmd programs and uh just on top of my head universities like case western university in ohio boston university in boston massachusetts and uh just the other one university of connecticut all these universities offer seven year program 
Okay. Uh, could we do the MBBS pathway and then do the USMD to do residency in the US? Absolutely. Yes, you could. Uh, but if your ambition is towards getting into a more competitive specialty, such as surgeries, as an IMG, international medical graduate, it's harder. It's the ratio or the stats that we got last year were only 1% that were admitted to such high specialties like neurosurgery. Most doctors, they can do MBBS, come to the US after giving the US MLE, but you will be matched into residency of family medicine or pediatrics or GP for the most part, because they leave the more specialized uh, things for people who have done USMD in the US itself. That goes for any bachelor's of medicine degree in any part of the world. Right? Any part of the world. Okay. Because uh, MBBS and USMD's rigor cannot be compared. The rigor that we go through in the last four years of medical school is beyond belief. Uh, because you need to imagine that we are being fed all those books in just four years. Okay, it's just four years. I don't know if University of Glasgow, I don't know if you have heard about it i think that was the only 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 university in the uk that used to when i was looking at used to give a four year and it would have in the brackets called intensive program for medicine so otherwise um yeah four years is uh the most um the idioms we get on that is imagine you're drinking water but through a fire hose if someone is opening a fire hose and feeding you water it's that kind of information that's get, that gets put in. Okay. Uh, how much does a cardiologist make? On on average? Possibly. Yeah. If, if that's on average, a cardiologist makes uh I would say four hundred plus, four hundred thousand dollars plus on average. But if you're more skilled, if you're more specialized, you could go up to five twenty, five thirty thousand dollars. Okay, uh, how much should be the primary SAT score? If you want to get into a good university, anything above, above a 1450 should be good. 1450 should be good. And if you want to get into like Ivy Leagues, anything above 1500 should be good. Okay, uh, would you recommend taking the MBBS route or the eight year duration? Uh, again, it depends on a personal ambition. Uh, your personal ambition lies where? Does it lie towards? Now, again, in the eight year duration, after the first four years, no one is assured a medical admission to a medical school. Okay. So many, many students, what they do, they go to the Caribbean and do the four year and then come back to the US. Uh, but in that four years, uh, if you get into a USMD program, then you're set. Right, then you do not have to worry about anything. But I personally, of course, if you're asking for a recommendation, if you're asking for a preference, I'm going to say that eight year is better because let's say in the first four years, you go through the whole rigor, you go through the whole pre-med, and then you realize, wait, hold on, medicine is not for me. I can, I can be attached to medicine in a different way, but going through this route is not for me. Right? So, uh, because I know many students who went through, who went to the UK and in the third year, they, they were like, no, this is not for us. This is just way too much and way too much to, you also need to uh, think about the emotional burden that we carry. I was just in my first year and I was in, on my rotation in an emergency department where I saw the first that I saw, I saw a patient die. And believe me, that day wasn't just like any other day. It was just that I could not think, I could not put my mind straight to it. It wasn't even my, it wasn't even my responsibility. The patient wasn't even mine, but you feel so much of, you know, the burden. So many students drop out because of that. So if eight years is a good way to reflect, the first four years is a good way to reflect that, yes, medicine is for me and I'm going to do medicine. If that's the case, I'm sure if you're that determined, there's nothing going to stop you from getting a good GPA and getting a good MCAT score, eventually ending up in a med school, right? So think of your short-term goals and think of your long-term long goals simultaneously. If, if just being a doctor and you want to get it done quick, 
then MBBS is the route for you. But if you if you want to really take your time and get into the whole idea of what medicine is going to be like, then go for the eight years. So you have the first four years to see and the next four years to actually do. Okay, I would personally recommend the eight year course or the seven year course, whatever it may be, because it, it really gives me also perspective. And it, as each day goes by, I'm more and more and more and more committed to what I want to do. That's very nice to hear. Okay, I think you already answered this question. Primary SAT source for BSMD program. BSMD program has generally a higher uh, SAT score. Uh, but if you get anywhere above the 1500s, 14, 1450s to 1500s, you're good. Make sure you get good grades in your school and then you're good. Okay, that's all our questions for now. Does anyone have any other questions? Is there anything in chat? I don't think. I don't think so. Can you make um, me the host for a minute? I want to share some links. I don't think I can. And if any of you guys have any questions, Mihira, I think you might have my email, or you can also personally share in the my social media handles if that's the case, because email is something that uh, I check probably once or twice a day. So if you want something more responsive, you can pass on my social media handle. And I think in the presentation towards the end, if you guys want any certificate of participation for this course or this this meeting, uh, I think Mihira, you have the presentation, right? So there is, I think, Sarah's number and there is Varun's number. So students or anyone attending in India can contact Varun and anyone who's attending in Dubai or have questions from Dubai can contact Sarah. Yes. So for the participation certificates, please fill in the feedback form. And once we get in your emails, we'll just send you the certificates. And uh, I've also sent in the registration form to be our member on the chat and our Instagram handle. We'll upload the recording for this webinar on our YouTube channel. So, you know, feel free to rewatch. And I've also put the email. You can send in your questions and should I, um, uh, okay, are you going to share your email in the chat? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll just, yeah. Or you can just email him directly. And I've also put the go to university webinar website. So you can register for any upcoming webinars from our society and from go to university side. And again, feedback form for participation certificates, please. Uh... I don't think I can put it to everyone. So I'm just going to share with Mihira and Mihira can put it in the chat. Okay, there are two more questions. Yeah. Uh, any good websites for medical school? Any good websites for medical school? Perhaps um, to learn during the free time, any good websites would be great. Uh, you can go through the aamc.org's website, which is the official American Association of Medical Schools website. Uh, they also have recommendations for what books you guys could read if you are uh, a passionate, you know, aspiring medicine student. So there are different books. Uh, I have one over here. Maybe you could, you guys have, I have this book. This book is really good. It's on the whole history and bio, uh, a biography of cancer. And so it, it goes through how cancer originated and from where it came from. So all these are there on AM and AAMC. Biography of cancer, the book. Okay. Okay, so I think that sums about our session. Someone don't bless you in the question in it. <laughs> so much. I hope it helped everyone. And if you do have any questions, Mihira has my email and my social media handle. So feel free to reach out. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much for attending. Thank you, Mihira, for hosting this and go to university. And Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Mukara, for this very nice session. It's, it was quite informative. Uh, again, participation certificates will be sent after you fill in the feedback form. And thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.